Quinn, you have just, I say, retired from a role that you've um, been held for a number of years at the Little Theatre, but I don't think you'll be retired from the Little Theatre, but would you like to explain a bit more about? Um, well, I'm hitting an age now when I have a bus pass. I don't really feel I can communicate like I used to with the youngsters because the age gap and everything that greater. Um, so I think it's time now that I hand the reins over to some fresher faces. And I'm glad to say I think uh, the two girls, Pauline and Danny, are doing a very good job. I know they've got plans. Um, but you're right, I won't, you know, I won't be out the door for good. Um, I've always said I would help the children see it up, which is why I'm here, this is why I'm here to do And also, any productions that the, the theatre company, the little theatre company, was to put on. Having spent so much time as a stage manager, company manager, professional theatres, I feel I can do a bit to help with the design of productions, uh, lighting, staging, and also help any other company that wants to come in and, you know, and start off again. There are a few companies in the area who don't have that experience. And, you know, I think while I'm here, I should pass that experience on. And that's what I've been doing. But I'm getting to the age now where coming here, I have to go up the railway bridge in, in, the, in the store. That's not much fun twice a day. <laughs> no, I do feel cold a lot more now than I used to. So I think it's time to, to step down. Uh, and, and, and let's see what happens next. Well, would you like to tell us then about um, the long involvement that you had with the theatre and just when did it all start? For me? Yes. It started, um, I was very young, I was seven or eight years old, and I had a great aunt who was the headmistress of the primary school in Coventry, in Camden, Coventry. And she came over one day and uh, for a holiday and my mother was worried about my reading wasn't up to the standard of other children my age. And um, how my great aunt knew about the children's theatre club in I don't know, but she did. And she suggested that my mother send me there. So we found out that it was in Abbey Street at the time, the tiny little theatre in Abbey Street, uh, the Bubble Warehouse. And that's how the name Little Theatre came about. It was the first Little Theatre, that's how it came about. And, um, that was shortly before the Little Theatre proper here opened in 63. And uh, I, I, I've been here ever since. <laughs> you know. And my reading improved. My reading age shot up dramatically. In fact, instead of being two years behind, I was two years ahead within about 12 months. And that was as a result of? That was a result of, of the Children's Theatre Club. Right. Because I learned very early on if I wanted to be in a production, I had to learn a script. And to learn the script, you had to be able to read it. Right. And that was the motivation it gave me. Oh, yeah, so, I, so, so I couldn't see the point of reading before, I couldn't see the point of it at all. I mean, when I went to school, my mother told me this, uh, when she, my first day of school, I went along quite happily. The second day, I found my eyes out. I thought I'd been, I thought I'd been, been a dumb bit. <laughs> <laughs> the second day, I was screaming all day. <laughs> but I soon realised that if I wanted to do what the other kids were doing in the theatre, I had to learn to read. And even to this day, uh, school teachers have said to me, we can always tell a child who's been to the children's theatre club because their the reading age and their attention span is far greater than the other average children. Not average children, it's just things an average child, but children who don't attend. So that, that's what I've always thought uh, was a nice achievement for the theatre club. So it is an educational charity, I mean, that's what we set, we set the charity up in 2001. Uh, I was amazed that it wasn't a charity previously, but it never was. So we set the charity up as an educational charity. And I think that the first and foremost aim of the children's theatre club is education. I've said to many parents, don't bring the children here if you want them to be West End stars. That's not what we do. But it happens as well. It happens as well, yes. We've yes. yes. got a lot of good track records yes. <laughs> of yes. people going into yes. the theatre. But again, it's about the inclusivity. Yes, yes. Giving every child a chance on Yes, on which, which I'm sad to say, in, in high level scale, is failing. 
When I went to drama school, I was 17 years old, and I, I got into drama school by doing an audition. I didn't have any A-levels, and I think I had two O-levels. Today, I won't even get that audition, because I haven't done any A-levels. Mm -hmm. So, and that's because drama schools now are now affiliated or assigned to, or attached to some local university. And in order to do that, and they now award degrees, the mm -hmm. drama degrees, acting degrees, they had any of that in my day. But in order to, for them to award that degree, you have to have a, a starting line, excuse me, five mm -hmm. or two. Mm -hmm. So the argument the drama schools had was if we do that, we, we're losing half our talent pool mm -hmm. with natural talents. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have got this in professional theatre if those rules had applied today. So you started off at the Children's Theatre? Children's Theatre Club. Then I joined the National Youth Theatre. Uh, yes, then the, the Flinty Youth Theatre. Yes, it was that room. Yes, National Youth Theatre came before the Children's Youth Theatre. Not that I did any productions on the National Youth Theatre, it was technically with that event. But I couldn't afford, well, my parents couldn't afford the time to send me to London for two weeks for one of their courses. It was far too expensive. Mm -hmm. But having said that, the Flinchy Theatre just started off, and a lot, well, seven of us from the Children's Theatre were here were family members of, of the Flinchy Youth Theatre. Uh, and we went to York, and since then it became the Blue Youth Theatre, they went to America. So that was something else that started and, and, and went on. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, that's no longer the case, it no longer exists. Absolutely. There's lots of things. Lots of things. Yeah, times have changed. Um, I heard Arlene saying earlier that you know, there was, when the theatre opened here, they had 200 members. What happened when Joe Holloway started the Children's Theatre at the old Pavilion Theatre, uh, the Dome Pavilion Theatre, where he was an actor with the Manchester Rep. That's how it started, but when he asked the director of the Manchester Rep if he could do something for the children of the world, that's how he started the club. Within a year, it had 200 members. You know, uh, and the first pantomimes were done at the Pavilion or the Queen Theatre uh, and the Town Hall. You know, we could do a pantomime at the, uh, the original Little Theatre because it was half the, the entire theatre was half the size of his room. It had 50 seats in it, and you know, it was four of you on the stage, it was a crowd. <laughs> the crowd scene, you know. But how marvellous that somebody said Yeah, that. yeah, I mean, they did Shakespeare there. <laughs> It's hard to imagine how it is, but actually it's Shakespeare there. There is a creativity in the realm, isn't there? Yes, there is a creativity in the realm, not just here. No. I mean, uh, there's a very thriving uh, photography club, or what well, used to be a good, very thriving club, uh, folk clubs, uh, uh, there's all sorts of things going on, you know. Uh, in the early days here, I mean, when this is was built, where we are now was a car park. Mm. We were in the car park. We only had uh, the foyer, the auditorium, the stage, and the two dressing rooms, that's all we had. So when we were doing pantomimes in the late 60s, early 70s, we had 60, 70 children in the cast. We only had two dressing rooms. Mm. So it was a squash and a mess of time. And then between shows, because you did matinees every day, you did three, three weeks of matinees. Uh, every day, you know, six days a week, you do two shows a day. That wasn't allowed today. <laughs> I don't think, but in those days it was great fun. And even though I only lived a hundred yards down Marsh Road up to the theatre here, I never went off for my tea. I stayed, I made sure I had a bag of hotties. Because I wanted to do with my friends here between the shows. We brought board games in, you know, I learned how to play chess in that dressing room back there. You know, because we were with your mates, so I was here from one o'clock in the afternoon until half past nine, ten o'clock at night. I've done two shows. And that's something that young people struggle with today, making friends. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's, it's a shame. I mean, we have children here now who they come in and the parents are very shy, you know, I don't think you like it. Well, let's ask him later and see what he thinks, you know. Yeah. And okay, sometimes they stand to one side, you know, and, 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 and then next week they sort of look at what's going on the week after that, they start to take more of an interest. And within five or six weeks, they're running around like, <laughs> I get anything, you know. <laughs> and, and it's true, you make friends for life here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I 
talk about Fred as well. Back here, back in the early 60s, I haven't seen some of them for 40 odd years. But we still keep in touch on the internet, on the internet now, I'm used to be the phone. <laughs> now it's this newfangled gadget thing, they call the internet. <laughs> There's another reason, another reason I'm standing down. All the equipment here is now far too technical for me. You know, instead of pulling a lever now, you have to tap in something. It's 16 different codes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and that's the point. It's, it's not just the uh, making a career, it is about how it changes. Yes, and yes. Lots of other skills. Yes. Now, you can go to college now and spend three years learning how to be a stage manager. Mm. Now, I was a stage manager, professional stage manager, when I was 19. Because I was thrown into it. The guy who me got the sack. And the next thing I knew, I was a stage manager. I didn't train for two years, I was just thrown into it. And that's what happened in, 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 in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And there was only one college, I think it was the London, was it London, London Academy of Music and Rock. They did the only technical course at the time, and that was a one year, or I think it was one year stage management, it was called the stage management course. And that was the only one at all in Britain at the time. Now, every university is doing one. Uh, they're doing not just te technical theatre courses, they call them now, it's not even specifically stage management. Which is fine, I mean, I can, I can do lectures on stage management, because uh, 90% is common sense. Yeah. It's what some of people forget. If, you, if you're doing the job, 90% uh, of it's common sense, and the other 10% is basically knowledge. I mean, doing TV work, and some of the actors, when they go for take 32 or something, You'll always hear somebody in the background say, oh, come on, it's not rocket science. <laughs> 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 you've been an actor, you've been a yes. produced, yes. Yeah, I am, you've yeah. um, managed. I've directed, perhaps managed, perhaps I've directed play, perhaps I've not, I've got to do it. What do you like doing most with that? All those different roles, what's, what's the best thing for you? Or are they all different? I, uh, All through my career, I thought I'd second into something and I wish I'd be taken to something else. And that's one of the good things about the career, you never know what you're doing next. No day is ever the same. Uh, whether it be TV acting, stage acting, uh, touring, you know, put in charge of a national tour or something, you know, where you have to organise the transport, not just of the scenery and the production, but the actors and the actresses. You have to make sure you have to literally put the ticket in their hand because they will forget it. <laughs> you know? I, I decided to stay in stage management rather than pursue a career in acting because I thought acting was a really silly way of living a living. So I thought it's more job satisfaction after being, after being a stage manager. I went out and, and, and I, I fought a war for years with actors because they always say if any goes on, they'll blame stage management. The stage management were always the, the whipping boys of the production. But for years, myself and friends of mine, tried to get rid of that uh, stigma. You know, so a lot, a lot of stage management is covering over what the actors have done wrong. There's always that thing on between the two. You're not going to be controversial over it. No, no. We're not going to upset anybody. No, no. <laughs> I was going to say something else. <laughs> <laughs> so you period yeah. with the little theatre, it started and then you Went right through until I was 17. Yeah. Uh, from the age of eight. Gosh. I don't have any age, I'm supposed to be nine to join, but I don't have any age, I've got to talk to So I sneaked in at the age of eight, just, just before the theatre of the And happy memories from that period? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, we were doing four plays a year, plus a pantomime. Mm. No, we still going to have to do one or two. So why is that? What's the difference? I think there's far more things available for youngsters to do nowadays than there was in the 60s. Um, you didn't have the sound from our TV channels, for instance. You didn't have computer games. Uh, and that has, you know, damage. Somebody else I knew when you see it and gone off the target, well to talk to you, you know, 
I went to Cardiff for an audition and they said, well, you've only just turned 17. We'll take you, but we'll take you next year. The Birmingham, the Birmingham School of Speech Training is going to go after a very long time. <laughs> it's now the Birmingham School of Speech Training. Uh, Birmingham. It's short, it's now, anyway, it's part of the university now. Uh, but I went uh, to Birmingham for an audition, and uh, the college was Little Georgian House. Basically, Georgian House. And it had the old coaching gallery to the theatre. We converted it to a theatre. It sat about 100 people. The stage is about as wide as this, and we did all the college productions in there. So I just turned 17 and I did my audition pieces. There were two little old ladies there auditioning me. And one of them said, now, You're going to meet the, 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 the principal, Miss Chapman, in fact, the Chapman, who was the principal. Uh, yeah, and then she got to walk out. And then this other woman said, Hey, lady, I'm Pat McChapman. <laughs> she was a few levels of that. Um, and we had a chat. Uh, she said, Well, she said, if you can get a grant, it will start on Monday. So I phoned to Prince County Council and I said, if you don't get a grant, I'm going to start on Monday. The following morning, which is a Thursday morning, I got a phone call, we start on Monday. Uh, that might not happen today. No, no, no. <laughs> no I don't think that won't happen today. No. Grants just aren't available now in the private no. school. But also they would take longer than a day. Yes, yeah, you know. And that was it, I started, uh, I started the following Monday. But it, without uh, that grant? No. I mean, it was £600 a year, which was £300 for the college, £100 a term, and I got £300, £100 a term to live on. Yeah. It was £10 a week. But also, I was in college, you did basically four and a half days. You did Monday, Tuesday, half day Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday. And the reason you had a half day Wednesday is if you've you got a job at one of the local theatres in Birmingham as a dresser or a stagehand. You could do the matinees. And they were very good, the college were very good at letting people go and work in these theatres. Because other theatres wouldn't let you. Uh, other, other schools wouldn't let you do it. But they always said, uh, I remember the principal saying to me, if you didn't think you could act, you wouldn't be here. So we're not here to teach you how to act, you already know how to act. We're here to teach you how to survive in the business. And that's what made that drama school. I always say that was the best drama school. Mm. It was actually taught you how to survive in the theatre. But also linked with the industry. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I met the Carry On team. They did a show called Carry On London, which they premiered in, in I think it was in Birmingham. And they the call came to the college and wanted dresses. No, I'll go. Well, for four weeks I was dressing Kenneth Connor, Bernie Beslow, St. James. Uh, and Peter Butterworth, uh, you know, the whole team. A great experience, and the one from Barbara Winter, uh, who sadly is no longer with us, but uh, I met her again on several occasions throughout my career, and we've always had a good laugh. I remember me, oh, she was a good memory. And I'll be actually you, my minister. I hadn't seen her for 12 years. I was doing pantomime in Belfast, and she came over to see uh, Cameron Ball, who was in the pantomime. She walked in, she saw me and said, hello, Gwendy, how are you? I haven't seen him for 12 years. Uh, you know, amazing memory. Yeah. So how long were you at the college for, Gwen? Two years. Two years. Yeah. The third year was optional, but at the end of the second year, I was requested. So they wanted to go to Swanton, you know, in the Swanton Rap. So I went. <laughs> and was that your first experience of actually working in the theatre? At the Swansea Rep, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, some, some of the repertory season. I think it was, the season was 12 weeks long. <laughs> and uh, it was like a fortnight in that place, because you did a play every two weeks. So when you finish the call at night, the next day you go in and we go for the following production. Mm -hmm. They'd have a tea break, turn the scene around, and you do the show you were here the previous week. And you did that for the entire summer. Oh, I think that I keep knocking the mic. I should do that, should I? Well, you know, you're a bit of an amateur in this. Oh, thing. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> screaming and drunk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say what you're screaming? <laughs> so, what happened then? Um, oh, where did we go from there? I went from Swansea Rat to the Old Rat, which Joe Holroyd, who was the founder of the Children's Stage Club, he was a fan of the old rep as well. Mm, yeah. You know, 
when Joan left here, he then founded the Salterdine Theatre. So he's a very busy guy. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, I went through the rep system. Uh, and where did I go after school? I go after school. Chester, Chester Gateway. I was there for Christmas, literally in the ghost train. And, uh... So you always managed to get some employment? Yes, because I, because I stayed in stage management. Uh, if you could act in stage management, it was a bonus because then you've done the study. So, I always found it easier. If, if your stage manager could act as well, it saved having an actress having to understudy another actress. If you see what I mean. Yes, yeah. Uh, because they then have to learn two parts and tax the brain and all that. So, we had to do that. <laughs> it used to be quite easy because he didn't really worry about it. Because he usually claimed if, if an actor was ill, and the show couldn't go on because only two people in it, two hundred. Mm -hmm. Then they cancelled the claim the insurance, you know. But then the insurance company said, no, if you're paying for an understudy, the understudy has to go on. And that changed the whole thing. <laughs> what the right would be? And I found myself having to go on in several occasions. Well, I had to go on in the same time next year as the two hundred. Uh, so I could play off the opposite every one week for that. For that. Uh, I also had to go on. We almost went on with Joe Brown in Sleuth, the, the, the two-hander. Uh, Peter Bird who was, was stuck in the traffic jam somewhere. And the show went on 20 minutes later. But I, I was in this dressing room, this cost an thing. This is not going to work. But he came in and said, oh, you're doing with my costume on. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know who was more nervous, Joe Brown. Really. But that's a good, um, a, a good message that the more skills that young people can learn, yeah, yeah. so that they. Um... Yeah. I mean, one tour I did it was a, a play called Having a Ball, which was an Alan Bleasdale play. Now that started, uh, that particular production was a repertory production in the Horn Church, the Queen City Horn Church outside London there. And it ran there for a month. Then it was going to go on the 26 week national tour. So the last week of the run at Hornchurch, they then put me in there in order to take it on tour for 26 weeks. I arrived there on a Monday, see it's a show, I don't know what i So I'm sure I sat there, I was the recorded, went to the dig. Next day, none of the company were in until the show time, basically. So I went in, introduced myself to the director. And I was on the contract to do not just company managers at all, I was at understudy three, three different roles in that show. One of the actors in that show was Ben Wallace, who was a Julian Wallace fan from the 40s. He was playing octogenarian going in for the second. That was a basically play. Uh... play yeah. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the director's office having a chat with him. This is at quarter to seven, and the show goes up at 7 30. And he's suddenly knocks on the door, calls him to one side. And I'm just sat there, and he comes back in and says, We've got a bit of a problem. I said, Well, thank you, you're on tonight. Ben Wallace had a stroke. And I was on that night. Mm. Literally, just over half an hour. No, I hadn't even met the cast. I met half of them on the stage in front of the room. Mm. And one actress, Sally Smith, I was sat next to her. Set was three sections and lights in different sections. Operators here is a waiting room and pre op room and a column at the back. And I was sat on the chair next to her. She was actually two bench and I said, Who the eat are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm your company manager, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might have wandered on by mistake. Yes, yeah, I think I'd coming from the car park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was on that. And I got through it because the DSM, the deputy state manager, had a book, and one of these uh, paperbacks of nurse uh, hospital stories, you know, nurse love stories. Yeah. And she puts Ben Wallace, because Ben wasn't really good at learning lines apparently, and put all his lines in this box. So he just wandered around in this box so we could see what was coming next. I thought, thank God for that. And that's what they gave me. 
So the tweed seams, I was referring to the vaccine. 